is great to be back. Um, I, this is some pictures from the past. Some of my favorite pictures. Luis, by the way, I'm sure says his best picture, but this is from a, a, a recent, this uh, recent visit. I, I have to wear a less wrong uh, scarf now. And um, that, that was the day I got it. It was a pretty West Brom scarf that day. It's my mom and some of my boys, actually all my boys. And I've enjoyed coming here uh, quite a bit. It's hard to go down here one more week to go up and listen to the audience. Uh, and an airplane moving very fast across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, but I really loved it here. I love the opportunity to work with several of you. And the Tower's a really unique place for Cork. It's a really unique place for all the um, expertise is that it has brought together. I think you guys are very lucky with that. So uh, the presentation that I'm going to give today, it is inspired by uh, some recent events that Steve alluded to where we had a hurricane strike my state. We were the, where the hurricane made landfall. Now I'll get to that in just a little bit, but I like to tell people a bit about North Carolina, particularly when I come over here, particularly to this country, okay? Um, North Carolina is the 10th largest, no, it's now the ninth largest state in terms of population, about 10 million people. It's one of the fastest growing states. If you take a look at any map of uh, the United States in terms of where people are moving to, uh, the southeast and the southwest will tend to win. The, we tend to be the, the fastest growing parts. There's a lot of internal migration, as well as migration in from the south of, of the Rio Grande. Uh, Raleigh is about five hours south of the White House. Sometimes I wish we were closer, and sometimes I wish we were farther away. And you can see the amount of precipitation we get. It's widely variable, generally wetter here, drier here, and very, very wet right here. But we have a spot right here that has over 2,000 millimeters of rain a year. You wouldn't guess that, but we do. If you're curious, I can discuss that later. Okay, how big is North Carolina? It's almost the exact same size as England. In fact, it's a smidge bigger than England. We don't have the population that you do, but the land area, we, we do have. And a little bit more about our geography. In the west, we have these beautiful mountains. In fact, I mentioned before this part here with 2,000 millimeters of rain a year, that has led that part of the state to be one of the highest concentration of waterfalls on the North American continent. And it is a wonderful, wonderful place to visit. And I tried to take my kids that a couple of mine are, are climbing right here. I try to take my kids to the waterfalls every year, all right? And then on the flip side, on the back side uh, of the state, we have these glorious beaches. If you look very carefully right there, you'll see something protruding from the water. That's a shipwreck. Uh, North Carolina is home to the graveyard of the Atlantic, and there's 400 shipwrecks off our coast, some of which, by the way, are very, very old. So you might, of course, Let's try that. Some of those are very old from the North American context. <laughs> so, speaking of the North American context, a little bit about history. Who is this guy? Is it Walter Sir, Walter. Sir Walter Raleigh. That is correct. Sir Walter Raleigh. And you may have learned this in school. Maybe you didn't. All right. We all learn it in school because the first attempt at an English colony in North America was made in North Carolina on Roanoke Island right here. It is now known as the Lost Colony because it mysteriously disappeared, okay? We can talk about that if you're interested in that too. But I do want to talk just to explain that England and North Carolina have particularly strong ties. The capital of my state is Raleigh, and it's not named it as an accident. But I was born in the city of Durham, so you know how excited I was when Steve and I visited Hadrian's Wall and we took a side trip to Durham, England. I was thrilled. Okay, and last but not least, the most famous event that happened in my state in human history was the first flight, heavier than an air, uh, aircraft flight. And that is uh, one of my all-time favorite days, actually, is pictured here with Steve Luis, another a friend of mine. We all went down there and was absolutely inspired by the fact that, um, as, as the guys, the docent said that day, uh, December 17th, 1903 was the day the impossible died. It had previously been impossible to have a heavy air flight, but that was the day it died. And for me, and I have a couple of students here, that's one of the things I love my students to internalize, is that what we don't know how to do right now doesn't mean we can't do it going forward. Okay, 
And for, after that little bit of background, so I always enjoy people tell me about where they're from. So I figured I might as well share you a little bit about them. Let's talk about hurricanes. Hurricanes cause problems in lots of ways. The winds blow hard. They will have what they call a tidal surge, a storm surge, where the water gets pushed up. We'll explain that. And then a lot of rain, which leads to all these bad things happen. And, I, and what I, I really tend to let you, there's lots of ways you can die in a hurricane. All right? I won't get into those one by one, but if you want to talk about it later, you certainly can go there. Now, hurricanes are rated. Remember, they basically bring these three things. All right? But they're rated on only one of them, and it's wind speed. And uh, you can see something very good. And the sustained wind means that it blows for one minute at least at that, at that speed. And so these are considered, three, four, and five are considered major hurricanes. One and two, they, do, they just call them hurricanes. And then less than 119 kilometers per hour, but great but greater than, I want to say, 70 is called a tropical storm. Okay. And this happens to be, we're talking about Cape Verde Islands earlier. They're right here. And the hurricane that struck us in September, well, when it was August, started out over here, over the west coast of Africa, and then found its way. And, and this is color-coded based upon these categories right here. And I remember getting a call one of the days right around there, where I told Luis, a lot of you guys know Luis, I told Luis because I was spending some time in Spain, I had gone home for a week, all right, to bring my kids back, they come to visit me, and I told her, I said, Luis, sometime in here, so Luis, my trip to Spain return might be delayed, because there's a hurricane, all right, well, he looked a few days later when it was in the category four or five stage, and he got, as Luis has pointed out, got very excited. He's like, don't come, do what you have, you know, he's like, just be careful. I was like, okay, that's fine. And then, as the storm got closer and closer and closer to making landfall, it got weaker and weaker, so that the time it actually hit us, it was in category one. And the media was like, oh, category one, you know. No big deal. It had been major, but it had, it had weakened. And people said, no big deal, no problem. So what I'm going to do now is I am going to show you this is my favorite. This is my favorite um, video that came from the storm. We'll play it right now. That will order struggles to keep his balance. <laughs> so if you haven't seen uh, this. Picking it up here in Wilmington, North Carolina, right at the end for Coast Toy. We're in one of these big ass. <laughs> Those guys. You gotta think that's just one of the funnier things ever, right? And so it was stuff like this, like, oh man, this isn't that big of a deal. Why are we even worried about it, right? This is not that big of a deal, right? So there was this, the national consciousness was it started out as a fault four, it got the week. Then this video shows up, and people are like, no big deal. Just another rain event, just another rain event in good old North Carolina. All right. But there was some legitimate wind damage that occurred right after the storm had, had come. Here's some along the coast. Here's some more where a, a home had been hit. And this is actually where I live, a little bit inland, actually a fair amount inland about uh, 200 kilometers away. And you can see in a walkway, and that thing smashed into that person's deck, all right? Now, you know, it's, it, I would probably call it more nuisance issues than anything else from the wind. And having said all of that, it wasn't like nothing bad happened just the wind. It was a, a mother and a daughter, or a son, I think, were killed, and uh, a father gravely injured after a tree smashing their home in Wilmington. So I don't want to make light of it, but understand that the storm, the wind speed wasn't great. And for the most part, most people like, well, this doesn't seem to be that bad of a situation. Okay, so that's the wind. The next part is the storm surge. And the storm surge is, you can see here, the elevation of the water is just, these are sand dunes 
that are being very easily overtopped. And, and if the storm surge doesn't just occur at the coast, we experienced storm surge this far inland. So as the water would go, it was about 80 kilometers inland, all right? And people know, how in the world does that happen? Well, as the storm is spinning, it's pushing water all the time above that eye. It's pushing water. So literally what happens is, is if the storm's moving this way, the water tilts up. Okay, so as the water tilts up, you can get three or four meters of high, just a wall of water from the constant blowing of the wind. And you can see that this causes massive inland flooding. And this is, these pictures were taken after it had begun to recede. And here's the proof to that point right there. There's only one way a boat can get there, and it is because, well, at one point, the tidal surge had gone up about four meters and pushed the sailboat up on the land. Okay, tidal surge is the one thing that you can pretty much guarantee, you can, you can pretty much do something about if you are you, and that is you can leap. Like, if they're predicting a three meter high storm surge, you just, and you look at where your house is, if you are less than three meters, or really I'd probably give myself a little bit of more of a window, five meters maybe, you just leap. And so what happens is you have this mass migration of people away from the coast when we know a storm is coming, they're predicting uh, surges. So people say, well, what happened to Hunt? Well, all your research sites. Well, really that was the last thing I, I needed to worry about. I mean, they are what they are. They're underwater, they're underwater. Here's an example of one of my sites along the coast. And this is very, very, in fact, they paralyzed giving some indication. It was gone. It was okay. It wasn't like it, it just was not monitorable, put it that way. We do a lot along this major arterial. You have the M40, it's the M40, right? The big one that goes down to. I love driving in. It gets me to get to the airport pretty fast, usually. Our main road that runs the east-west length of North Carolina is Interstate 40. There it is near one of our research sites. And there it was not that far. You know, it's pretty significant in terms of clutter that's it, but this actually is just the beginning. Because what I'm about to share with you here is one of the more amazing things I have ever seen. Roadways, as you might know, are designed so that they don't flood. Think about the M40 flood, all right? This is Interstate 40, and it has turned into one big, long river, all right? At least for big chunks of it. You can see that wide swath. And when I saw this video, released by our Department of Transportation, our Highways Department, that's when I knew that we had real issues because I, as a civil engineer, had studied how to design this road and I knew that an interstate highway, the most frequent it should flood on average is once every 500 years. And so when you see a, a, an event like that, you're like, hmm, something big really happened. In fact, to me, this next picture is the most apocalyptic scene I've seen, uh, I've, I have observed in North Carolina in my life. And that was what was on the road after the interstate had flooded were these uh, thousands of dead fish. And the reason they died was, well, you can imagine that they, they got disorientated they, and they, and as they were over the road and the oxygen levels crashed. And so they were basically in the backwater and that's what's left of a whole lot of fish. In fact, it's an incredibly bizarre video to watch the people pressure washing the fish off the street. I can only imagine the stench. Okay, so this road blocked acts. Oh yeah, this this is so this is the state of Virginia. All right, state of Virginia, and they said, okay, uh, everyone who was following Virginia's department, they're like. Um, don't drive in North Carolina. The state, it's like being in Wales and trying to go to Scotland, right? And they're like, okay, you just, you can't drive through England today. This out, England's out. Just try to go somewhere else. But you can't go through England, it's closed. And that's essentially what happened with North Carolina. They said, do not drive through the state, it is closed. And every one of these black dots is a roadway and it was closed 
about four days after this, or three days after the storm hit. I did not capture it at the peak. There were actually more road closures in West North Carolina as the storm <coughs> moved up this direction, okay? But you do get some sense of how widespread the flooding and how massive this flooding was. So what's causing the flooding? It's not the storm surge. It's not the wind. It's just straight up rain. That's the end of closing. In fact, Wilmington, I'll show you a picture. Wilmington's right here. Wilmington is the largest city uh, along the coast of North Carolina. And it became an island because every single access point into town was shut down. Okay? So um, here's a project site in Wilmington. You can see where it was right after it was built. And this is not the exact view of it, but it is in the same shopping center. As you can see, it was underwater during the event. So how much rain fell? This was a snapshot taken before the storm was done, and it isn't inches, so some of you probably are like, what is that? I will at least tell you that 26 inches is what it ended up with, was 660 millimeters. Now I saw that number, and I'm like, wow, there's a lot of water. Let me see how that compares to what would be projected, because one of the things that we have, we're very blessed with across the United States, are a lot of data. And every single one of these things is a, is a rainfall record. That will be 30, 40, 50, 60. In some cases, uh, the Raleigh Durham Airport, I think it's an 80 year record. The Wilmington Airport that I'm pulling here is uh, um, from World War II. So it would be 70 plus years. Okay, so it's a long rainfall record. All right. And so, I pull the rainfall record up to see how, to put into context what 660 millimeters of rain was. Now, what I want to show you, these are precipitation frequency or depth duration frequency curves. And what that means is that anything along, let's say this green line, is expected to occur statistically on average once a year. It's really once per every 1.01 years, all right? And so that's the green line. And then the, the gray line at the top is expected to occur on average uh, once every 1,000 years, or the likelihood of occurring in a given year of 0.1%. The likelihood of that event could occur. Just to frame this for you. And so I'm going to show you, and by the way, these numbers here are in centimeters, not millimeters. This is how big the storm event that fell on Wilmington was. It exceeds the 1,000 year storm. All right? That's pretty bad. But guess what? It wasn't the worst. In fact, if you take a look at the communities that had more rain, it was bad. But there's this many that have even more. And the winner, or the loser, depending on your perspective, for the most rain was Elizabethtown, North Carolina. And check this out. Here is the return frequency for that event. Up, 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 up. That is the 1,000 year storm. It almost doubled it, okay? 950 millimeters in four days. So I did some looking last night, see how much rain y'all get in Coventry. 650. <laughs> 950 millimeters in four days. So we were talking essentially biblical levels of flooding. And you're like, my God, what an incredible one-time event, except it wasn't really a one-time event. When I first started my job uh, in 1997, we had a hurricane that came shortly thereafter, Hurricane Floyd, and this was the storm. I was like, this is going to be sort of my, the storm of my generation, Hurricane Floyd. All right, and so for example, in Wilmington, we've already established where uh, Florence was, but this was Hurricane Floyd. A little shorter duration, but it was still over a thousand year storm. That was Hurricane Floyd, okay? And, and then, well, we also Hurricane Matthew. And so for Hurricane Matthew, uh, I think Goldsboro, this is Hurricane Floyd. Uh, 
this is a 500 year storm, a 200 year storm, a 100 year storm. Okay, so that's Hurricane Floyd. Here's Hurricane Matthew. Here's Hurricane Florence. Now, this one city, one part of the state that had something greater than a 100 year storm, another one greater than a 200 year storm, and another one greater than a 300 year storm, all in the span of my half career. Now that, folks, is a problem. And, and, and by the way, it's experienced at least a 100 year storm, and there's an asterisk. And you know why an asterisk is there? It means that it's a caveat. And the caveat is, these numbers are all based on these older data. All right, these older data. And, and the, actually, the data actually included Hurricane Floyd, the first one from 1999, rainfall totals. It included that, but it didn't include these last two that fell. All right, and so then I, I gave this seminar, something similar, in East North Carolina, and I did the following. There are different ways of trying to get people involved. I said, all right, everyone that lives in East North Carolina, that's what ENC stands for, where Sir Walter Raleigh sent his people. Raise your hand. So people raised their hand. I said, okay, how many of you believe in the accuracy of these curves? Keep your hands up. And guess what happened? Every single one of them. Every single one of them left. Now, the thing is, went down, is what I'm talking about is not isolated. This is Houston, Texas from last year where they got almost a thousand millimeters of rain over one week. A thousand millimeters of rain over one week. Um, in the Pacific Basin, this is another classic headline. Yet another typhoon is headed towards Shanghai. This is an incredible picture I pulled off uh, from hurricane hitting Hong Kong, or typhoon I should say. Um, the rain in Spain from a hurricane, we didn't learn that that was going to happen. But it was coming to Europe. And even, I just checked, extra tropical storm Ernesto hit you guys. I think it, Ireland took the real brunt of it. But it was this year that this happened. So it makes you wonder, right? I, when I talked to my colleagues in North Carolina, the engineering community, I said, I don't want to talk about climate change as a future thing. Let's talk about what's happening right now. The data are they are right now. And we need to make some decisions based on that. So my focus is actually not on massive storms as a, as a meteorologist or a climatologist. My job is to help build infrastructure that will help reduce flooding, preserve stream health, clean up water quality, things like that, all right, become amenities. And so how does all of that relate? Well, when we design stormwater control measures, we are not really having an impact on these massive storms. So we're, this is, we're having an impact here on a water quality event. Here's your buddy. He's coming to visit, I know, Neil. I've heard he does not like permeable pavement. It's his prerogative, you know, you can have opinions, which is free. But do these things, do, and, he, and he's, he's a character, always a good, always an entertaining conversation with, with Neil Armitage. Um, green roofs, blue roofs, New York City. What do these things do? How much do they help? In fact, this is, uh, we, we have a, a study on disconnecting downspouts, which works surprisingly well when you take a rooftop and then you have these roof leaders and the water flows we measured, we monitored the side where the water is flowing across. And you can see that the average runoff reduction on a per event basis was really high. Okay? But some of you also, but all of you, are pretty keen on looking at data. You're like, whoa, but there were some that the data weren't particularly good, these outliers, all right, where the runoff was not really reduced all that much. You want to guess, can you tell me one thing? That these these low, so this is the volume of runoff reduction. What is the one thing you think that these low runoff reduction numbers have in common? They are associated with exactly big storms. And so a lot of people say, well, let's put more of your stormwater practices in, though. 
I'm like, and, and do what to a 900 millimeter rain event? Or 500 millimeter rain event? And do what? And so that is a bit of an issue, all right? We designed stormwater practices generally to treat moderately sized events. And we can do a very good job of treating moderately sized events. And we keep them relatively small because they've got to fit into urban spaces that people, you know, don't miss or, or are easily integrated into the landscape. Um, the other thing that we do with those, we want to make sure that they can safely convey big storms so that they're not blown away during big storms. Uh, and this is the one thing that, in my opinion, we can we need to start factoring in. And to be, to be fair, when we go back through and we do some of our numbers, maybe the size of a, the moderately sized event that we're going to treat, in North Carolina, it tends to be 25 millimeters. Maybe the number does end up bumping up to 30 millimeters once we factor in some of these new rainfall totals. But that's more of on a margin. That's a marginal change. The bigger issue is how do we deal with these very large storms. And frankly, the data, which are, we are blessed with a, a lot of data that have been collected, these charts need to be redone. Clearly, if you've had, we've had two events now in the last three years, where we're seeing a 1 in 100, 1 in 200, 1 in 500 year return rainfall for big swaths of our state, they need to be redone. They're not right. So that's one of the things, certainly, that's going to be going on in North Carolina. We need to make our practices uh, more formidable. I mean, this is almost like a pillbox, and maybe we didn't go that far. But these systems need to be more formidable. They need to be, they need to be resistant to very large storms, all right, unless we want to pay money every, and which, which we may choose to do. Your option is you just go out, apparently every 10 years, and make major renovations or re refer re restorations to the practices that have been hit. Perhaps the most important thing, and this is a little bit easier said than done, I think, in a command and control society versus a free market one. And in general, I, uh, I appreciate free market decisions, but uh, how many of y'all do you know externality? One of the things they require engineers to take in the United States is the economics. And we spend some small section on externalities. And externalities is a pretty good word there. That is when, a, when the market can, does not account for and we'll call it a product of the, trans of, of the transaction. Meaning, and the most classic externality is environmental damage, okay? So if someone's going to uh, make a product that they, that they dump a waste into the river and then sell that product, the waste that's dumped into the river, unless the government comes in and makes you pay for it, is an externality, which means it's not reflected in the transaction. Okay, well, this is a big deal. This, this, this comes back uh, to preserving areas that might flood because the developer, his or her window or time frame is maybe three years. And that person, based, particularly when you base it on these older curves, when you base it on these older curves, that person may be able to put together a development that based upon these older curves does not flood at a frequency that's needed and so we will see practices or we'll see developments going in places that are environmentally prone to flooding based upon the new rainfall, right? And so that is, and so in a free market society, that is a major issue because the developer, his or her exposure is only for three years. So as long as it doesn't flood in those three or four years, they've sold their product, homes, shopping centers, and are gone, right? And then when it floods, who's left holding the back? Who's gonna pay for it? Well, you might say the people that bought homes there, but it's more than that, because those people are insured by the same insurance company that insures me. So if they bought a home that's prone to flood because they built in an area that was prone to flood, everyone, the society, pays for it, all right? 
And so this is going to be one of the major things that we see again in our sort of free market economy, where areas are going to be set aside that look like they might be potentially buildable, but the reality is based upon the new rainfall, we know they probably aren't, or they're at least subject to flood. Now in China, it's a different story. The government does what it wants. You were just there, or recently, like, we're going to do this, boom, and they do it. Or in this case, we're going to not do this. And it's preserved. It's a little bit easier to duck, said and done uh, there than it is, say, in the United States or in, in the UK. And the thing is, is that once you preserve the space, there are lots of opportunities for it. It certainly ties into making communities more resilient and attractive places to live. Here's an example where they dedicated space without a flood to recreation and real. Here's a case, uh, this is actually in Sweden where they have little soccer pitches on their stormwater management devices. I think it's a pretty clever idea. Uh, and the, I want that relates to poor specifically is the idea of, of having a place that might be in flood once in 10 years, or maybe it's gonna be once in five years. I don't know, based upon the change in rainfall and the, or the rainfall that's coming. But maybe we can start dedicating some of those places, which was done here in this water course, to, to things like cut flowers or harvest some vegetables. And, and, and if, and if we lose a crop once every 10 years or 25 years, that's just the risk. That's just the risk. But at least we're not trying to pay to have move someone away from a, a home that is a much more expensive issue to deal with. Okay. Which now gets me to my main takeaway points. First thing is that there's no doubt large storms are occurring. Um, it has been shown that in the, in the Pacific Basin, they have a much higher rate of uh, <coughs> typhoon formation. Now, the Atlantic Basin, that is not the case in terms of the formation of hurricanes. There is no trend upwards. However, the rainfalls associated with them certainly appear, and I certainly in North, not only appear, but as a matter of fact, in North Carolina, have gotten more intense and they're bigger. Okay? Stormwater practices themselves do not account right now for this new rainfall reality. And there's going to have to be some change, but it's not as if we can expect to solve the problem. Because it's not going to be solved by structures that we built. I love your green roofs, they're not going to do much next time you get a 660 millimeter rain. Okay? And then the last piece, and this is the one that, you know, it shouldn't be controversial, but it is going to be in a free market society. The government's gonna to have to come in and say, guys, you can't develop here. I know the flood map says it should only happen in one in a thousand years or one in a hundred years, but we've known that this area here has flooded three times in the last 20 something years. And so it's gonna take some political will for them to go ahead and say, you can't develop here. Because for those of you, you think, who are the biggest contributors to local politicians? You guys have an idea? Who gives the most money? If I were to run for mayor or the county council, what group contributes the most money to their election to help them get elected? Oh, right. In the U.S. In the United States. Property developers. Property developers. And it doesn't matter if it's Democrat or Republican, by the way. All right. The Republicans tend to get more of the contribution, but Democrats get it as well. That's how they get elected. And so if there's one group that's going to really fight the idea of saying, oh, right now I can build on you, and you take this away from me, that's not fair. Well, is it fair that you're probably going to saddle somebody with a home that's going to flood? on average once every 25 years based on this new rainfall reality. That is the one that's causing the most issues. By the way, Steve, that's one of our all-time favorite pictures. That was up in the Northeast. I love that. I love that shot. Anyway, I appreciate your time. And uh, the goal of this presentation was to generate discussion. Hopefully, we'll do that. And again, thank you so much for hosting me. And um, I'm going to continue to enjoy my last week here. OK. <laughs>